Welcome, this is Dr. Owen Anderson, and today we're going to look at Islam. We're going to go over some of the basics of Islam, but then also look at a talk given in 1893 at the World's Parliament of Religions, and that helps us think about Islam in America. So some of the basics that we want to think about are pre-Islamic Arabia, specifically it's a polytheism and nomadic structure. You find, uh, just like many of the places in the world at that time, you find, this is late 500s, early 600s, polytheism and all of the understanding of the structure of the world that goes with that, as well as this is not just simply uh, gods, but also spirits that are involved in the world, good and bad, jinns, angels, demons, Satan, and how to interact with them. And so that influence continues over into Islam. And then we have life of Muhammad. And especially what we see there is um, raised, orphaned, raised by his uncle who is a merchant, which involves travel. So he becomes aware of the world. He has a kind of cosmopolitan upbringing because of that, aware of different cities, different concerns, he interacts with uh, Jews and Christians. I should also add this up on pre-Islamic Arabia. Um, outside of Byzantium, the uh, Eastern Roman Empire. For us, we think of the Roman Empire, we think of, well, the city of Rome. In the Eastern world, they would think of Constantinople or Byzantium. And that's going to be a source of conflict with Islam all the way down to, well, I guess you could say the present. Because you might have noticed there, if you look on a map, you won't find Constantinople. You'll find Istanbul. And you might wonder, how did Constantinople get the works? So that happened. That was a major battle that went on for centuries, conflict until the final siege and destruction of Byzantium, Constantinople. And so if you were to do military history, that'd be one of the top 10 battles of world history. And one of the top Christian churches is in uh, Constantinople, Hagia Sophia, top examples of Christian architecture. But now you'll find it's surrounded by four minarets. It's been transferred into being a mosque. So you can think about how that resonates in the Christian mind, just like you would if you thought of that in the Islamic mind, right? If, if Christians took over Mecca and turned it into a church, that'd be greatly troubling to Islam. So here you have the church for Eastern world. It's one of the top churches for the Western world, but it's the church for the Eastern Christians, and now it's been made into a mosque. So there's still that tension there. And in down in the present day, but when I say outside of Byzantium, why I say that is that those who were teaching aberrant heretical views of Christianity who weren't executed were exiled. Either they self-exiled ahead of being arrested or they were kicked out of the empire. And they would tend to go toward this area of the world, the Middle East, whether Iran or somewhere else was now Iran. And so when you hear, when you read about Muhammad's contact with Christians, it strikes you that they weren't Orthodox Christians. And by Orthodox, I mean small o, but at the same time, it also is, it's maybe a bit of a pun because it's also capital O since they're contrasted with Greek Orthodox Christians. Orthodox means they hold to the creeds of the Christian faith. 
So there's some reason to think that he that his understanding of the Trinity, for example, is that it is God, the Father, Mary, and Jesus. Or his understanding of the uh, incarnation is that God inhabited a body. That's called Nestorianism. Or that there was a really good teacher that God adopted as his son. So to understand the Christian view on those things, you need to understand the councils of Nicaea and Chalcedon. And then you know the Orthodox view, because it might be that many people still think that kind of thing, right? Like, not, they're not sure what it means to say Jesus is the son of God. And so, in other words, that's not Muhammad's fault. It makes you, it has questions then about what's going on in the Byzantine Empire. But it does raise then difficulties in Christians and Muslims discussing things because of perspectives of each other from that. So pre-Islamic Arabia, then you have the life of Muhammad and he is troubled by the state of Arabia. Think about contrasting, it's uh, divided into family groups. Nomadic means uh, family structure of, of uh, government. Families rule the important cities, Mecca being the most important city, Medina being the second. And he contrasts that naturally in his mind. Why, why are we like this? And the Greek or Roman world is so influential. And what he comes to is, well, we're divided up among ourselves, worshiping these different gods, whereas the Byzantine Empire, they just have one god that unites them. So that's what we need, one god to unite us. So he wants a clear vision or revelation to explain the truth about God. This is, this is the, let's say his words, well, translated English, his words. He wants a clear revelation. He prays for that. And so the answer he's given is in the Quran. Which is delivered to him by the angel Gabriel. And he uh, receives it by hearing and is to recite it back to show he knows it. And the answer is that God is one, eternal, absolute, irrevocable. The word of God is the Quran unchanging and it contains the law the humans are to follow the teaching that God is one it discusses angels and jinns and their role in the world the absolute predestination of God all things it's a it's a, it's part of the dis debate in islamic philosophy is how to understand that and the the majority view is that every moment is predestined by god like created afresh that's how absolute it is the resurrection and judgment of all mankind so islam believes in the resurrection just like Christians and, and uh, judgment. That's different than the teaching about going to heaven, dying and going to heaven, and you don't have a body anymore. And then the people of the book, in contrast, uh, the people of the book, including Christians and Jews, but where they've gone astray, what happened, and Muhammad and his message 
as a correction to Jews and Christians. And we'll see some of that come out in the talk we're going to look at. What, what's the main sticking point of difference in Muhammad's mind with the Jews and the Christians? Now, what do you need to do? That's one way to think about the difference. What do you need to do to be a Muslim? Well, one of the attractive things about it is it's, it's pretty straightforward. The five pillars of Islam. I think if you were to ask somebody, what do you need to do to be a Christian? They might say like, well, you, I guess you say a prayer to Jesus to save you and then be nice to your neighbor. But it'd be a little vague, right? What does that mean exactly? Whereas here, it's very straightforward. This is one of the attractive things that allowed Islam to spread so quickly. We have five pillars. One, um, recitation of the creed. There is no God, but God and Muhammad is the prophet of God. Very succinct teaching. Even earlier when I was discussing the Trinity and the dual nature of Christ, and I had to refer you to Nicaea and Chalcedon, people say, that's really complex. I have a really hard time wrapping my mind around what the Christians are saying there. So there's three gods? No. So Jesus is uh, just God? No. So it's, I'm not sure what they're saying. That could be hard. This is pretty straightforward. If any, any Muslim has ever asked, what do you think? There's the answer in one sentence. They're rejecting the polytheism of what came before in Arabia. And he asked for a clear, clear revelation. Well, that's pretty clear. And that's a universal creed across all the divisions of Islam. That's what's nice, too, is the Christians don't really have one thing. Nicaea sort of served as that, or the Apostles' Creed. But even the Apostles' Creed is longer than this. Apostles' Creed is probably the closest thing to this in terms of straightforward Christian thinking. But across the differences in Islam, they can all affirm this. So first pillar. Second, prayers five times a day. Might be some variation in how you do that, but generally you do that five times at appointed times toward Mecca. Giving of alms for the poor, the Ramadan feast, our fast. And the pilgrimage to Mecca. For anyone who is able, and able is pretty broad, so they might recognize some persons who aren't able to do that, but generally everyone should get there at least once in their life. So this is pretty straightforward, and it might be some variation on the fast. Is it from sunup to sundown? Generally, that's what it is, not a 24-hour, 30-day fast. Sunup to sundown. And then what you fast from, just like the Christians on Lent might give up red meat, but they still eat pork and chicken and lobster during Lent. Not red meat. But the general idea is, yeah, a whole month set aside for fasting and prayer and reflection. So these are pretty straightforward. If you're trying to explain this to, the, to so let's say, North Africa. North Africa had been Christian, and Islam spreads through it, I don't know, was it under 50 years from east to west? And if you're trying to explain Augustinian philosophy, Augustine having been an African philosopher and theologian, Compared to this, which one's more direct? Well, this. So it spreads quickly. Well, we'll come back, come to the spread in a moment. Uh, now, more on the life of Muhammad, which will get us into the divisions with Jews and Christians. His uh, rejection at Mecca, initially, 
He brings this message, goes to the Kaaba. You may have seen pictures of the current day Kaaba with a, a cubicle building in the middle that houses in one of its corner, corners of black stone. And you see people walking around it. That was also there in presumably different form at this time as a site of polytheistic worship idols all around there instead of just that central building. So he teaches that and, and uh, there's a lot of money to be made in idol manufacturing. So they don't accept it. And he goes instead to Medina, second city. I don't know if you had to use an American example, New York and Chicago. Although I think Chicago's sort of fallen, right? New York and LA, no, neither one of them would, they'd both say the other one in Medina. So it goes to the city and gets a following there. And then he goes back to Mecca and conquers it. And so we have this, this practice in Islam from the example of Muhammad of the use of force which problematizes how the next history, I presented, I'm presenting both sides of how the history unfolded. One side is how Islam would present it is, well, we've got a great message. Others might say, well, you, yeah, you conquered us with the sword. And he told us we had to believe this. So this fight goes all the way into Spain and then into France. And another major battle, if you like to study world battles, this is, this would be up there top 10, maybe even higher, the Battle of Tours with Charles Mart Martel. And the reason that would be up there isn't necessarily because of some great military feat, but because it determined if Europe would be Islamic or not. And the French kept Islamic, they crossed the Pyrenees, lost, went back into Iberia, Spain, and occupied Spain for a number of centuries. And all of modern history revolves around Spain's reconquista, or the Spanish reconquista of Iberia. Why? Because as soon as that happened, they knew there was still the conflict. It was the last, might call it the last of crusades. They're out of Iberia, but they're still a powerful enemy. We need to establish trade routes with India. We're probably not going to be able to do that through the Middle East. So let's find an ocean route. And the rest is modern history, right? Columbus, et cetera, Cortez, French, English, where we picked up in our history. So Islam factors in very greatly into the origins story in that sense of the Spanish. And sometimes that reconquista then, those conquistadors, that's the name they have in Mexico also, right? They come into Mexico, southern, what is now southern United States, California, and uh, have that, that history still with us of the Spanish view of military conquest. Return to Mecca. Now, we're not going to get into the history of Islam from there or the uh, divisions within Islam between Sunni, Shiite, and Sufi. It's enough to know this much. And then, let me see, let me add up here to correction to Jews and Christians. They were given a word of God and corrupted it. Specifically about atonement. There is no need for vicarious atonement. Think about the high holy day for each religion. For the Jews or Israel, it is the day of atonement. It's in the title what they're doing, right? What is it for the Christians? It's coming up. 
Yeah. Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Yeah, it's interesting not to call it after the goddess Ishtar. Um, Resurrection Sunday. So why? Well, that's the same thing as being taught here. Christ died. Why is Good Friday good? It seems like it's a dark Friday. Well, that's when atonement was achieved. So uh, death and resurrection of Christ, the Lamb of God, right? That's connecting you directly up to the Old Testament imagery. When John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's directly connecting that up to Passover, the day of atonement when you offer the lamb, and the resurrection of Christ. But with Islam, you don't have a day like that. There's no sacrifice like that. They, they do sometimes have a practice of imitating Abraham's offering, but that's not understood to be a vicarious atonement. By the death of the Lamb of God, your sins are forgiven. In Islam, each individual is judged for his own deeds. You're going to see that come out in the, the presentation we're going to read. No representation, Adam or uh, Christ. Adam represented humans. He fell, so his offspring fell. Christ represented humans. He was righteous. So those he died for are righteous. That's representation. So no representation. Uh, no sacrifice for atonement. Sacrifice meaning the death of another. So that's a central difference if you had to summarize it quickly. Not yet the Trinity, not even the dual nature of Christ, simply Islam says we come from this previous tradition, but they've corrupted theirs. So, uh, we build on Judaism and Christianity, but correct what they corrupted. And now ours is incorruptible. And that's a question. Judaism and Christianity will ask, well, wait a minute. How can yours be incorruptible? Why couldn't ours have been incorruptible? If the answer is, well, God gave this one, but you just said he gave the other one also. So is it somehow like the Jews and Christians are worse sinners? That can't be what it is. So that's still a tension or a question point between the three. If God gave it, then it would be upheld, is the idea. Because a good part of the Quran is correcting, especially Old Testament stories, Abraham and Ishmael, what exactly happened to Joseph. So now fast forward to the present. Islam and modernity. So we had the Crusades of the uh, 12th and 13th centuries. The hero that comes out of that is Saladin, general that retakes Jerusalem. Virtuous general, someone you should read about at a time when war was vicious. Saladin stood out for his virtue. And then, so, so that you say, well, that's not, that's the medieval ages for Europe. That's not modernity. No, but it sets the, the stage for it. The uh, Reconquista of Spain. Is this an I? Yep. Fourteen nineties. And then discovery of the new world as Europeans look for a way around the Middle East. 
They don't, they don't try to reconquer Jerusalem after having lost it. They had a, they had a kingdom of Jerusalem for about 100 years, the Europeans. They lost it. And then it became a conflict between two or three different factions within Europe, within Islam. So then the new world and all of the modern world, modern expansion and colonialism, including into the Middle East, English and French fighting each other over the Middle East. The Battle of Trafalgar, you should read about that. I remember walking into the British Museum and you go around one corner into the archeology span section. And as you went in, boom, right in front of you in a case, there it was, the Rosetta Stone. Read about it since you're a little third grader, there it is. You say, what, a package of software was behind some glass? What are you talking about? No, the stone that allowed us to translate Egyptian hieroglyphics because it also had Greek and three, the same thing written in three languages that we are, two of them we knew. And Napoleon's team, the French found it. Well, why is it in the British Museum? That's why you have to read about Trafalgar. How did Admiral Lord Nelson win that battle and yet died in the battle of French snipers? His, his lieutenants told him, where are one of our jackets? So you won't be shot by the snipers. And he refused. I won't hide. England expects every man to do his duty. And so he was shot to the spine. It took about an hour or two to die. And his last words were, thank God I did my duty. So that's Admiral Lord Nelson. He's just, let's see, he's right there, right? That's the British... British Museum, and then you have Trafalgar Square. So how do we get onto that from Islam? Well, the French and English are fighting over Egypt, the Napoleonic Wars, and the English uh, win, Napoleon loses. That's part of colonialism and expansion. So you think about it from the British perspective and they make a big tower with, with uh, Nelson on top, but you think about it from the Middle Eastern perspective, and foreign countries, it's not that even if that you're fighting a foreign country, foreign countries are in your country fighting each other. Yeah. Colonialism, and they're fighting for resources. That's very different from uh, missionary efforts, right? Oh, yeah, the Christians are always going door to door in our country telling us about the Bible. That's way different than colonialism where you're fighting over the resources of someone else's country. And so then you have the rise of European nationalism. 19th century, which leads into World War I huh, and World War II. And one of the major Islamic countries, Turkey, is pulled into that World War I, Ottoman Empire, which becomes Turkey. Ottoman Empire fighting on with the wrong side of World War I, losing side, I guess, not wrong. Uh, Germans then weren't, weren't quite the same Nazis as World War II. So we're fitting, this speech we're about to look at is fit in here. 1893, World's Parliament of Religion. How do you present Islam? We're, we're, we're using a book a documentary history of religion in America, fourth edition. And it, it points out that Islam is virtually unknown on its own terms to the Americans. So it, it's known of, in fact, our first military conflict as a country was against uh, Muslims in North Africa, Barbary pirates, Thomas Jefferson. So it's known of, but on its own terms. And that's why we're reading this, to get, get someone who is, is uh, within Islam, respected within Islam, explaining Islam to an American audience. And so how does he do that here? Muhammad Webb, the Muslim representative to the Parliament of Religions. So I'm going to read this and go through it together. Do 
you suppose that any active religionist who has studied only his own system of religion, who knows nothing about any other system, can write fairly of any other system? So first point is about the need to understand another system. From their perspective. And really that's what I've said about why we're using these talks from the World Parliament of Religions is exactly to do that. But at the same time, I don't think that it's impossible to understand another system from outside. This raises some questions about what is called perspectivalism. Do you have to be on whatever, fill in the blank, to understand whatever, fill in the blank? That's an interesting philosophical question we're not gonna deal with right now, just to put it on the uh, board to think about. So he says, though, it's absolutely impossible. And he's gonna give an example. I've read every history of Muhammad and Islam published in English. And I say to you, there is not a single one of them, except the work of Amir Ali of Calcutta, which reflects at all, in any sense, the spirit of Islam. And that's understandable, especially if it's mostly been a time of conflict. If you were to go to any country that's at war and ask the people of that country to explain the other side's perspective, they'd probably do a very poor job. We will take the work, he's gonna take the work of Washington Irving, for example. Washington Irving evidently intended to be fair and honest. It's apparent in every line that he meant to tell the truth, but his information came through channels that were muddy. And while he is appalled at what he considers the vicious character of the prophet, he is completely surprised at times to find out what a pure and holy man he was. Now, the first book I ever read in English upon Islam was The Life of Muhammad by Washington Irving. And the strongest feature of that work to me was its uncertainty. So book by Washington Irving. What was that title, Life of Muhammad? In one page, he would say Muhammad was very good, a very pure and holy man, and it was a shame that he was not a Christian. But his impious rejection of the Trinity shut him out from salvation and made him an imposter. Those are not the exact words Irving used, but they convey pride of the same meaning. After saying these things, he goes on to say, what a sensuous, grasping, avaricious tyrant the prophet was. And he clo closed his work by saying that the character of his prophet is so enigmatical that he cannot fathom it. He is uncertain, finally, whether Muhammad was a good man or a bad man. So Irving looks at some virtues, considers the rejection of the Trinity, and then looks at vices and concludes with uncertainty. That gives us a look at his method. We might have a different method for assessing someone. I'd mentioned Saladin up here, a virtuous general, and it surprised Christians to find out there was a virtuous general who wasn't Christian. And that's kind of the idea you'll find still sometimes. If you're virtuous, you're Christian. You might not even know it that you're Christian. And that's why you'll find books like Jesus in Lord of the Rings, because they think any book that has virtues in it must have Christian influences. So that's kind of the method here. If Muhammad has virtues, he must have had Christian influences, or maybe he secretly is a Christian. Now, to, to uh, Webb's point, though, of understanding other, other systems, that's kind of what I was getting at up here about, about uh, Muhammad and Christians and Jews. His sources for Christianity and Judaism weren't, weren't the orthodox sources. They were what I would call, a broad phrase, is Gnostic Christian sources. And so because of that, 
that shapes his perspective on Christians. Just like Webb is saying, you had your perspective shaped on Islam. So it's happening all around. Now, to understand the character of Muhammad and his teachings, we must learn to read between the lines. We must learn to study human nature. We must carefully analyze the condition of the Arabians at the time Muhammad lived. We must carefully analyze the existing social conditions, and we must understand what women's position was in that social system. The various conditions that had possession of the whole Arabian nation. They were not, however, a nation at that time, but divided into predatory tribes with all the vices and weaknesses that man possesses almost as bad as men in some of the slums of Chicago and New York. You like that? Almost as bad as those, because yeah, some pretty, pretty uh, awful spots of New York and Chicago. They, they have to be careful throwing stones at uh, anybody else. Um, almost as bad as them. Muhammad came among his people intending to purify and elevate them, to make them better people, and he did so. That's back up at our top of our notes, life of Muhammad and pre-Arabian conditions, pre-Islamic Arabia, I mean, conditions. The history of uh, Mohammedism we have in English, as I've shown, is inaccurate, untruthful, and full of prejudice. So the truth must take into account the context of Arabia and the human condition. Now, let us see what the word Islam means. Islam is the most expressive word in existence. It simply means, and literally, simply and literally means resignation to the will of God. The Muslim system is designed to cultivate all that is purest and noblest and grandest in the human character. Some people say Islam is impossible in a high state of civilization. Now, that is a result of ignorance. Look at Spain in the 8th century, when it was the center of all arts and sciences, when Christian Europe went to Muslim Spain to learn all there was that was worth knowing. Languages, arts, all the new discoveries were be found in Muslim Spain and in Muslim Spain alone. There was no civilization in the world as high as that of Muslim Spain. The height of civilization was developed by Islam and Muslim Spain as an example. So with this spirit of resignation to the will of God, when that's inculcated, with that is inculcated the idea of individual responsibility. that every man is responsible not to this man or that man or the other man, but responsible to God for every thought and act of his life. He must pay for every act that he commits. He's rewarded for every thought he thinks. There is no mediator. There is no priesthood. There is no ministry. The Muslim Brotherhood stands with a perfect equality. Recognizing only the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. No distinctions, otherwise national. The emir who leads in prayer preaches no sermon. He goes to the mosque every day at noon and reads two chapters from the Holy Quran. He descends to the floor upon a perfect level with the hundreds or thousands of worshipers and the prayer goes on. He's simply leading it. The whole system is calculated to, the, to inculcate the idea of perfect brotherhood. So he's appealing there to this value. Obviously, brotherhood, that was one of the three terms for the French Revolution, fraternité, and the other egalité, equality. So he's appealing to those in this, this American audience. 
or at least a, a Western audience in Chicago, 1893, Islam is actually the religion that gives you that. Your monotheistic religions have priests. So people aren't equal. There's priests and there's laity, two kinds of people. Islam doesn't have that. So clarifying misconceptions. About Islam, it, that it's maybe it's uh, barbaric, and he's saying no, it's not. When the Europeans were stuck in the feudal system, they went to Spain to learn from Muslims. The best, the best uh, Christian theologian, many people think, is Thomas Aquinas, and he's quoting Islamic philosophers and theologians. So clarifying that no, that's not true. Uh, clarifying that it is. Now, he, he mentions women briefly in the part we read, but he sets up how he'll answer it. Other uh, problems within Islam, say about the status of women, well, that's due to the context of the culture out of which it came. That's not a feature of Islam. That's due to cultural context. So women were treated that way in, in uh, pre-Islamic Arabia, and that's where Muhammad lived and the, the culture he grew up in. So you can explain things that way. And there's variations in how Islam views women based on which culture you're talking about Islam in. So he heads off objections from that, like, well, you guys have a low view of women or something. He heads that off. But he's really getting to it, I think, when he says, no mediator. I mentioned to you the uh, creed. There's also the inscription on the Dome of the Rock. God is one. God is not begotten, nor begets. God has no cohort. I'm going to add up something up here. Christians and Jews, his contact with Christians... contact with Gnostic Christians. So the Dome of the Rock is, is that famous dome in Jerusalem. The rock it's built on is understood by the Jews to be the rock where the sacrifices were offered. And it's built there so the Jews can never again restart their sacrificial system. You'd have to destroy the Dome of the Rock, which is not, not going to happen from the Muslim perspective. So it's not as if the Jews can build it somewhere else. It's like, well, just build it over here. That's the only site for it. That's where, where uh, uh, Solomon built the temple. So you have the Dome of the Rock there, ending the building ends the Jewish temple system. And it declares the Christian system false. So the Christians aren't tied to the rock that's there or the temple, but they are tied to the belief that Christ is God, the Son of God. That he is eternally begotten. Now that's a word left out here in the inscription. This phrasing sounds more like what you would say about Baal, Astra, and their baby, the golden calf. God has a wife, a cohort, and together they begot a child, the golden calf. That's called the pagan trinity. And you see it in, lot, in, in Egypt, Greece, Rome, Canaan. And it could be easily confused then with the Christian Trinity, except for none of that is going on in the Christian Trinity. It's very important to add in the word eternal. Christ didn't have a beginning, or let's just say, sorry, the Son of God had no beginning. Eternally begotten, not, but, but Jesus of Nazareth did have a beginning. Two natures, not one nature. 
And a lot of confusion happens when someone confuses those natures. Well, Jesus was, God was born in Bethlehem. Christians believe God was born in Bethlehem. That's technically false. You could probably get away with saying that, but the eternal son of God didn't have a beginning. So this is still the central, this one building symbolizes and speaks the continuing division. Do we need vicarious atonement? Jews and Christians, yes. Islam, no. And then uh, is the lamb of the lamb sacrificed at the temple sufficient? Jews, yes. Christians, no, of course. Uh, that's the Lamb of God, not the Lamb of the temple. So that division still remains. Now, post biblical Judaism, so, well, sorry, we'll go there. So Islam would say, You are saved by your works. That's what he said in the reading. Each individual person is judged by their works. And post-biblical Judaism might be similar. Post-temple Judaism. You're judged based on what you do, good or evil. Not Most Jews aren't thinking there'll be a, a, re a start, restarting of the temple system. So this is the continuing division. Can you be saved by your works? This is more basic in one sense between them than the, than the Trinity. If you can't be saved by your works alone, then you're pushed into one of these answers. If you can be saved by your works alone, then you don't need Christ or a lamb. You can do it by your own works. So that's still dividing difference. Now, one last point about John 1 and the Quran. The Quran is said to be eternal, unchanging, etc. And so the book itself has special significance. If you were to harm a physical copy of the Quran, it's, it's like sacrilegious. If you were to harm a Bible, some Christians might kind of wince just because, oh, that's a special book, but they wouldn't, there's a, they'd say, well, I'll just go to, cost, to, to Goodwill and buy another one. I've got 20 copies of Goodwill, or it's online. There's not special significance necessarily attached to the physical item beyond respect. But with, with the Quran, no, this is a special item. And yet, and that's why English translations aren't actually accurate. There's, you really need to learn the original to, to get to the actual Quran. So there's this eternal Quran. Now that should remind you of the Christian teaching in John 1. The eternal word of God. And it's interesting because here you have, in one way, the Christians avoid some of the problems that Muslims run into when you say the Quran's eternal. What are we talking about? Like the physical book has been there from eternity, or the ideas in the book have been there from eternity, but haven't all of God's ideas been there from eternity? Not just the ideas in the Quran, all of them, all of God's ideas are eternal. So you run into some, some questions there. Whereas the Christians don't think Jesus of Nazareth existed from eternity. He's the human nature, the incarnation of the eternal word of God. So, so realize something that's going on here. The Quran isn't God, but it's said to be eternal. Only God is God, but the Quran is also eternal. This could pose a problem. So that absolute God is God. There are two eternal things. And you see how the Christians have solved that. The book, the Bible is not eternal, but there is an eternal word of God, 
which became incarnate. And if they say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. The word of God can't become incarnate. Well, what are you talking about? The Quran is incarnate. There's a physical book that's incarnate, right? These eternal ideas became physical. So some of the objections about the Trinity we find, or, or specifically the dual nature of Christ here, we haven't got to Holy Spirit, the dual nature of Christ, we find the same problems coming up when they begin to talk about the Quran. Both Christians and Muslims face this problem. The Christians, the Christians face this problem, and they had to resolve this. Who is Christ? He said he's God, but he also has a body, and Christians don't believe God has a body. So the human nature of Christ has a body. But this is the eternal word of God. So how does the eternal word of God relate to God? Is it the same thing? Is it different? Those same questions are going to come up for Islam and the Quran. It's just that they don't have a creed that sorts it out. Nicaea. But you'll have the same problems with the physical Quran being the incarnation of the eternal word of God. Right? Now, the Christians have that with the Bible, but I'm pointing specifically more to Jesus because that's who John points to in John chapter 1. The incarnation of the word of God. So continuing divisions and yet continuing overlap in problems that need to be solved. 